Welcome back, everyone, to Four Winds Fellowships and our Bereans Bible Institute, module number two. In module two, we're talking about the doctrine of God and his son. In section A of module two, we discussed how John presents Christ as the son of God, and he uses the Genesis creation account as sort of the foundation for him uh, his introduction of Christ um, his pre-existence his um, agency in the creation and so forth in uh, section B of module 2 we looked at Proverbs chapter 8 which portrays this person called wisdom and then we showed how that the Apostle Paul uses that passage as sort of his foundation for introducing Christ also as the agent through whom God created all things. Um, now we're beginning um, section C in module two. In this section, we're going to be talking about the angel of the Lord, this figure that, uh, that is featured prominently in the books of Moses and especially also in the book of Judges. Um, he's uh, this person called the angel of the Lord or the messenger of Yahweh is literally what it says, um, is interacting on God's behalf with the patriarchs, um, with Moses, and then later as Israel is led into the promised land um, and the land is divided up under Joshua and then, of course, the period of the judges. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what's interesting about uh, the first in the first two sections in, mo in uh, module two A and B, we're dealing with the way that the New Testament writers interpreted certain things from the Old Testament, the word and the wisdom of God from the Old Testament, how they applied that to Christ. But in those passages in the Old Testament, it's not clear that this person um, in the creation account that's involved in the creation account, the second person, it's not clear who or what this person is in the Old Testament scriptures. Not until we get to the New Testament and the apostles reveal these things to us, uh, do we then are we able to see um, this person clearly in the Old Testament scriptures. That is, in other words, without the apostles' teaching regarding the second person, um, just from the Old Testament scriptures alone, it's actually quite difficult to discern this person. Now, Paul talks about the fact that the Son was a mystery a secret that was concealed in the Old Testament times. And he uses that sort of as his basis for developing this theme of who Christ is and how he was the first produce of all creation and all that sort of thing. But there is in the Old Testament scriptures alone, without any, without any help from the apostles, um, there is a second figure who is called both Yahweh, that is, he uses Yahweh's name and he interacts with humans on behalf of Yahweh. He is clearly a mediator between God and mankind throughout the Old Testament. And he's a real person. There's no question that it's a real person who is appearing. He's the one who appears in the burning bush and speaks to Moses. And he is repeatedly called in the Old Testament, the most translations have the angel of the Lord. Literally, <coughs> excuse me, the word angel is messenger. The term both in Hebrew and in Greek simply means the messenger of the Lord, the messenger of God. He's called, but he is also called both God and Yahweh using God's personal name. So in this section, we want to look at this person um, in the Old Testament scriptures and how he is then portrayed in the New Testament. And does the New Testament and the Old Testament actually connect 
this person, this second person who is called God and Yahweh, does does the scripture actually connect this person with Jesus Christ, the Son of God? The answer to that is yes, absolutely it does. And so we're going to look at the ways in which this person is portrayed in the Old Testament and then how that is linked in the New Testament to Christ. All right, so the first thing I want you to notice is at, on, the, on your notes there on the screen is that there's a feature in the New Testament that we don't really see in the Old Testament at all. It, that is, it's, a, it's an idea that is virtually new, at least, at least in the sense of it being explicit. And that is that God, the Father, is invisible and has never been seen by mortals. You would not get that from just reading the Old Testament scriptures. You only get that from what is revealed to us by the apostles in the New Testament. And so because of that feature, the fact that God has never ever appeared to anyone in the, in the Old Testament, because of that statement that we see repeatedly in the New Testament, we have to reevaluate a lot of passages in the Old Testament, which seem to portray God himself as appearing to people sort of in a human form. And so this sets up a serious uh, conundrum, let's put it that way, for those who are only looking at the Old Testament. All right, so um, <clears throat> there's... Before we get into whether God is invisible, has never been seen, and cannot be seen by mortals, I want to also point out that there is something in the Old Testament sort of about this in sort of an indirect way. And that is found in 1 Kings 8.27, 2 Chronicles 2.5, and 2 Chronicles 6.18. And it is Solomon's statement when he built the temple. His statement was something along the lines, praying to God when he dedicated the temple, uh, praying to God and saying something like this, the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. That statement by Solomon indicates that God cannot be confined to one place. On the earth that is God cannot be confined the father cannot be confined to a, a a form that can be confined can exist just in one place on earth that is he is greater and bigger than his entire creation and so to have God just showing up as a person in a particular place is something that's antithetical to this concept of God being greater and bigger than his whole creation. All right, so we have that statement by Solomon in the Old Testament as sort of a hint that there's something else going on in the Old Testament when we see God appearing as a person, as a man, like you know, standing face to face and talking to Abraham and discussing whether or not he's going to destroy the righteous with the wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah and so forth. So there's something else going on here. All right. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's an important point. So let's just look at the new Testament statements from the apostles about this really important fact that God is invisible. He has never been seen and he cannot be seen by mortal humans. So let's look at these uh, passages first. All right, the first one that we come across if we're just working our way through the New Testament is John 1.18. And this one is, is really critical. It's probably the most important of all of these statements. It says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him, or He is the one who has portrayed God. Now, what's important about this is that no one is an exclusive statement. That is, it's in totality. No human being, no mortal has seen God. But 
the, the words in red here, at any time, are also critical because at any time extends this to all time. That is, it extends this statement all the way back to Genesis 1, verse 1. No human has ever seen God at any time in history. That's what this statement is saying, which raises an important point right off the bat, because who then is this person who's called Yahweh and God, who's speaking to Abraham face to face, speaking to Moses face to face. All right, so we have a, that's introduced here. And it's important that it's intro, this statement is introduced in John chapter one, because John one starts out by talking about this person called Logos, the word, who was with God at the beginning, who through whom God created all things in John 1, 3, and then who became flesh and dwelt among us. That this is an actual person because he's called, uh, John 1 says he was with God and it says he was God. He was God. The word God is a personal noun. It always refers to a person. It doesn't just refer to abstract things or qualities. So, all right, so this... <clears throat> this person um, in John chapter 1 was God's agent in creation. John sort of summarizes or brings to a conclusion his prologue by saying no one has ever seen God at any time. It's the only begotten son who has made him known or declared him. All right, so that's really, really critical. And it's also important, keep in mind that in John 1, this person called the Word is also called God, as I just said, which we will see that that is the case with the angel of the Lord or the messenger of Yahweh that appears throughout the Old Testament. All right, let's move on. <coughs> In John uh, 5, 37, Jesus is speaking and he says, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time. Again, he uses this same statement that we see here. Or, or nor seen his form. God's form has never been seen. Not at any time. All right? Critical statement. John 6, 46. Jesus again. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Jesus is saying, I'm the only person, and at this time he's human, who has seen God. The Father. No other human has ever seen the Father. All right. Colossians 1.15. Talking about Jesus Christ, Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. Again, invisible God means God who has not been seen. It's the same thing John's talking about here. But this is a critical statement too because this is actually is in agreement with what John 1.18 says. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now, why does Paul link the invisible God with the image of God? Because an image is something that is seen. You see, even the pagan gods, the pagan gods were not seen. The Bible says that the pagan gods are demons, but they were not seen by humans, but they did have an image. They did create images as a visible a representation of their pagan gods and so we see here that what Paul is saying essentially is that Christ is the visible representation of the God who is not visible the God who is invisible all right so that's important so it's essentially saying yes there is a way of seeing God but you can only see God by seeing the image of God, who is Paul is identifying as Christ in this context. In 1 Timothy 1.17, Paul says, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. Again, he uses the same word, invisible, in reference to the Father. In 1 Timothy 6.16, Paul writes, Who alone, referring to the Father in the context, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see 
that's also a really important statement it's not only that they haven't seen God it's that humans mortals are not capable of seeing God with the eyes in uh, Hebrews 11 27 he writes uh, he's talking here about um, um, Noah I believe it's either Noah or Moses I forgot which but anyway it says he endured as seeing that is as if seeing it's Noah here by the way as seeing that is as if he was seeing him who is invisible again God is not visible and we have in first John chapter 4 verse 12 we have another statement that's almost identical to John 1 18 no one has seen God at any time now <clears throat> the reason I also included verse 20 is because biblical Unitarians will take these passages of Scripture and they will say well when it talks about no one has seen God it means no one has fully comprehended God it's not it's not saying that no one has ever seen God with the eyes and the reason they have to say that is because um, they don't believe in Christ's pre-existence and so he cannot be the image of God who has portrayed God to the patriarchs and and so forth in the Old Testament and so they'll take those passages about seeing God and they'll say well the word for seen there to see can also sometimes mean to see with the mind that is to perceive with the mind and so therefore these passages are not saying no one has ever actually seen God it's they're saying no one has fully comprehended God in his in, in his entirety so that's their way of sort of getting around these verses but what I want you to notice is in first John 4 how that John contrasts seeing God with seeing our brothers our human brothers he makes this contrast and because of this contrast it's clear that John is talking about seeing with the eyes all right so look what he says here no one has seen God at any time skip down a few verses for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen now obviously he doesn't mean we have fully perceived everything about our brother he's talking about you can see him he's there right he's right there with you we can see him with the eyes so he says for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen that is with the eyes how can he love God whom he has not seen so the contrast to seeing your brother and not seeing God is very clear that he's talking about seeing with the eyes and so the statement above no one has seen God at any time in this context is clearly saying that no one has seen with the eyes no one has seen God with their eyes they have never seen him all right all right um let's scoot down here <clears throat> so this raises the question now since the apostles repeatedly state that no one has ever seen God in the Old Testament or at any time which includes obviously the Old Testament then it raises the question who is it that we see in the Old Testament who is sometimes called God sometimes called Yahweh and people saw them saw this person with their eyes who was that that they saw that's the question right that arises from all of these New Testament passages well John 1 18 tells us it's the only begotten son right no one has seen God any time the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he is the one who's made God known at any time in the Old Testament John 14 9 he who has seen me has seen the father now this is a really important statement because Jesus you know he's he's about to be crucified he's about to be betrayed in John 14 and he's sort of having this conversation with his disciples and his disciples say uh, show us the father and that's sufficient for us we want to see God 
You know, right? Show us God. And Jesus says, says to him, have I been so long with you and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, why is Jesus saying this? He who has seen me has seen the Father. He's saying it because he's saying, I am the image of the invisible God. The same thing Paul said in Colossians 1.15. I am the one who portrays God visibly. Right? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Well, this, when you look at all these statements, this statement is also true in the Old Testament times. That is before Christ came as a human. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And this explains all of those passages in the Old Testament where this other person shows up and uses God's names and God's titles Yet that other person is called the messenger of Yahweh, which means he cannot be Yahweh himself if he's the messenger of Yahweh. Yet he uses Yahweh's names. All right. So, all right. In Colossians 1.15, again, Christ is the image of the invisible God. These passages are telling us who it is that was seen in the Old Testament when the text indicates that someone saw Yahweh or saw God, who it was that they actually saw. In Hebrews 1, 3, Christ, Jesus Christ, is portrayed as the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Again, this is what is visible or what has been visible. It's true not only of Jesus when he came as a man, as is stated here, Jesus said that, but these, these passages, this one and this one, also are telling us in the broader scheme, that is throughout all time, the one who has seen Christ, the Son of God, has seen God because he is portraying God in the only visible way that God has been seen up to this point. All right, now let's go to... Um, we want to look at we want to dive into the Old Testament and look at this person who's called the messenger of Yahweh and the fact that he is called Yahweh and he is called God repeatedly in the Old Testament text now the primary passage here that we need to look at first is Exodus 23 20 through 23 in this passage God is telling Moses that he is sending his messenger, his personal agent, this angel of the Lord or messenger of Yahweh. He is sending him and that he is the one, the one Yahweh sent is the one who is going to lead Israel through the wilderness into the promised land and defeat their enemies um, in the promised land, this angel of the Lord. He's called the angel or the messenger of Yahweh in this passage. And God says of him that you are to heed him and take and listen to his voice. He may not, <coughs> excuse me, he may not forgive your sins if you disobey him. But then he makes this statement. He says, for my name is upon him. And this is how it reads in the Greek version of uh of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. But in the Hebrew version, it says, my name is in him. But either way, whether you say it's upon him or in him, the idea that God's name has been given to his messenger means that he can use God's name. He can be called by God's name and he can speak as God. He sp as God's agent, as God's representative, he speaks as God. And so what we find is that what the angel of the Lord, or the messenger of Yahweh does in other passages, God is said to have done. And vice versa, when the messenger of Yahweh appears and he does certain things, uh, he is called God and he is called Yahweh. And this is because of this concept of personal agency. All right, he speaks for God. He is God's agent, not in the same way that, so, let's say, the prophets are God's agent or 
um, uh, other angel, other angels, other messengers are God's agents. What you will find when you look at the other angels who appear or the prophets when they speak, they will make it clear that they are speaking for God. They will say, thus says the Lord, right? And then they will quote what God says. But that's not what we see primarily with this one person who is called God's agent or the, the angel of the Lord. This person actually is called Yahweh. And this person actually speaks as though he is Yahweh. Without saying, thus says the Lord, he'll speak and he'll use the first person. I led you out of Egypt. I did these things. I made my covenant with you and so forth. Yet it's clear in the context, it is the angel or messenger of Yahweh who is the one there who is speaking to these people face to face. All right, so that's this passage is important to show that this one person, this one messenger of Yahweh carries God's name, his personal name as his own and uses it as though he is himself God. In uh, the first time we see that this messenger of Yahweh appears is in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13, <clears throat> when uh, Hagar, the, the messenger of Yahweh, appears to Hagar after oh, she's sort of kicked out by um, Sarah, or she departs because of the conflict with Sarah. And in this passage in Genesis uh, 16, Hagar saw Yahweh's messenger, but then she says that she saw Yahweh. All right, that's important because it shows this concept that we see introduced in Exodus is actually working its working out in the passage. People who see Yahweh's messenger say they saw Yahweh or they saw God. They use both terms. All right, so we see that in Genesis 16, 13. In Genesis 22, this is the passage where the messenger of Yahweh calls to Abraham out of heaven and stops him from uh, killing his son Isaac. And he affirms the Abrahamic covenant again um, to Abraham. But in Genesis 22, 12, there's an interesting statement because it says that, the Yah that Yahweh's messenger calls to Abraham and look what he says. He says, now I know, notice the first person, now I know that you fear God. Okay, so this is first person talking about himself but he refers to God in the third person, right? So he's distinguishing himself from God here, clearly. He says, now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. From me. This is a critical statement. He didn't say from God. He didn't say, now I know you fear God since you have not withheld your son from God. He says, you have not withheld your son from me. He's clearly making a distinction. He's not quoting God here, right? He's clearly distinguishing himself. But what this statement proves is that earlier in the chapter, when it says that Yahweh or God told Abraham to go and sacrifice his son, that the one who told Abraham to do that was the messenger of Yahweh, not Yahweh himself. Because otherwise he wouldn't be able to say you have... Um, not withheld your son from me. The fact that he is saying this means he's the one that commanded Abraham to go offer up his son. Yet again, the passage says God told Abraham or appeared to Abraham and told him that. All right. <coughs> so that's a critical, a critical point, but it's showing how the mechanics of this agency actually works in the text of the Old Testament. When it says God said this or God appeared to somebody and said such and such, we have instances where it's clearly the angel or the messenger of Yahweh who is the one who is showing up as God's agent and actually doing that. But he's called God. He's called Yahweh. All right, Genesis 28 uh, through 48. We have a long section of several chapters where God and Yahweh is said to have constantly aided Jacob throughout his life, right? We have many instances of that when he's separated from Esau and Esau's uh, trying to kill him 
and then he goes to uh, Laban to find a wife um, and so forth and we have the you know where he works seven years for for um, um, Rebecca um, not Rebecca Ray, uh, Ray, I'm getting confused anyway he ends up with the wrong wife and he works seven more years anyway we see God is said to and Yahweh is said to be aiding him throughout all that but when we get to Genesis 48 16 Jacob makes an interesting statement it says he's praying and he's giving a blessing uh, on Joseph's sons just before he died and he says this he says that Yahweh's messenger who delivered me from all evils bless these boys Yahweh's messenger but it's it's stated throughout all those chapters that it's Yahweh who's doing who's been delivering Jacob throughout all those instances all those chapters all right so we see this dynamic working in many places in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 32 uh, 24 through 30 we have Yahweh's messenger wrestling with Jacob and in this in this uh, in incident while he's wrestling with him he changes his name he says you're not going to be called Jacob but your name is to be called Israel and it's what's interesting about this is who else in the Bible ever changed someone's name by God's authority we see Jesus doing that right he changed Peter's name he says you're no longer going to be called Simon but you're going to be called Petros which means a stone Peter All right we see these we we see Jesus doing exactly the same thing that the messenger of Yahweh did in the Old Testament that is authorizing this name change which is prophetic it's prophetic as to what that role of that person is going to be so what's interesting about this is when his name is changed by this this person Yahweh's messenger who's wrestling with him then Jacob asks the messenger of Yahweh his name he says what is your name but Yahweh's messenger refused to give it he simply says why do you ask me my name and he doesn't tell him what his name is well why doesn't he tell him what his name is well this is because in the New Testament we see that Paul refers to Christ as being a mystery or a secret that was hidden in the Old Testament and we see that secret is clear right here in this passages but after this person the Yahweh's messenger leaves Jacob he claims in this passage he says I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved now did he see the father did he see Yahweh himself no the New Testament is clear no one has ever seen the father yet he sees someone he calls God face to face and this is because he is Yahweh's messenger and Yahweh's messenger bears Yahweh's name and his titles as his authorized agent <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> just one second now let's move down to Exodus chapter 3 here in this passage uh, this is the burning bush passage Moses goes to see the burning bush and it says that the messenger of Yahweh appears to Moses in the burning bush but yet as you continue reading the passage Yahweh's messenger refers to himself as God he says I am the God of your father Abraham Isaac and Jacob and then when he tells he sends Moses to go talk to Pharaoh he says to tell for Moses to tell the Israelites when he goes back that Yahweh God of your fathers the God of Abraham of Isaac and of Jacob appeared to me yet when he appeared to him it clearly says it was the messenger of Yahweh who appeared to him so we see this same principle working its way through all of these passages where Yahweh's messenger is called Yahweh and he's called God all right um, in Exodus chapter 14 verse 19 it says that the messenger of Yahweh 
is in the pillar of cloud and fire, but later it says that Yahweh is the pillar in the pillar of fire or looking down in the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. In uh, Judges 2, this is a really important uh, passage. Judges 2, uh, 1 through 2, actually all the way through verse 4, but Yahweh's messenger appears to the Israelites after um, they are in the promised land. And he claimed credit for being the one who brought them out of Egypt. And the one he claims credit for the one who delivered the covenant at Mount Sinai. That is the Ten Commandments. That is the messenger of Yahweh is the one who actually did this. So it says that the messenger of Yahweh appears to them and he says, quote, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant. I want you to note he calls the covenant, the Mount Sinai covenant, my covenant. This is the messenger of Yahweh saying this. I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Again, it clearly says in this passage, it's the messenger of Yahweh who is speaking. Right? But he's God's agent. He's speaking on God's behalf. But clearly, he refers to the covenant as his covenant because he's the one who brought it to Israel on Mount Sinai. He's the one who gave the Ten Commandments and did all these things. And we'll see the New Testament confirms this also. In uh, Judges 6, 11 through 24, Yahweh's messenger appears to Gideon sitting under a tree. <clears throat> but after it says Yahweh's messenger is there... Uh, speaking to Gideon, it says in verse 11, it says, I'm sorry, verse 14, it says, then Yahweh turned to him and spoke, and then it quotes what he said. Now, clearly, the Father in heaven, it's not talking about the Father in heaven, it's calling Yahweh's messenger Yahweh, because he's the one who was there that Gideon saw, and it says he turned to him. That is, he's actually moved his body or his whatever form he had. Um, he turned to him and spoke to him. And again, um, in verse 16, it says, Yahweh said to him. Again, messenger of Yahweh is being called Yahweh. And again, in verse 23, Yahweh said to him. All right, uh, Judges 13. <clears throat> this is when the messenger of Yahweh appears to Samson's parents, Manoah and his wife. And after this long interaction talking about uh, the child that's going to be born, Samson, and so forth, um, Manoah asked the messenger of Yahweh his name again, just like Jacob did earlier. Remember when Jacob asked him his name, he just said, why are you asking my name? And he didn't tell him what his name was. Well, Manoah asked his name. And he replied, why do you ask my name seeing it is a secret? A, the KJV says a secret. The uh, Jewish Publication Society, this is the Jewish Bible, it's not Christian, says, uh, why do you ask my name seeing it is hidden or it is concealed? Why do you think... Now, some translations say seeing it is wonderful. That's because the Hebrew word can be translated either way. But the New Testament refers to Christ as being this hidden or secret that was concealed since the very beginning of creation. That was It was concealed, but it's revealed and is, re and is revealed as the Son of God. We saw that in the last uh, section B of module two when we talked about wisdom and how Paul portrays wisdom we see that he spends a lot of time talking about this hidden mystery this hidden secret which had the rulers known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory right he's this is the secret this is part of the secret it's wisdom <coughs> excuse me and it is the messenger of Yahweh it's the same person all right, so at the end of this, after um, Manoah asks the messenger of Yahweh his name, he says, why are you asking my name since it is a secret? 
Then he ascends to heaven, and this is important because we see that the messenger of Yahweh descends and ascends to heaven. You need to keep that in mind because of other passages that talk about the one who is ascending and descending. It's not the Father who is ascending and descending. It's the messenger of Yahweh who ascends and descends. So just keep that point in your mind because we're going to look at that uh, in a future lesson. All right, so Yahweh's messenger ascends to heaven in verse 20, and then Manoah says, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Again, did they see God? New Testament says no one has seen God at any time. No, but they saw the image of the invisible God, as Paul says in Colossians 1.15. Now, let's scroll down here. Jesus is identified as Yahweh's messenger in both the Old and the New Testament. All right, this is a really important point. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, uh, it's translated different ways, but it says, um, a child is born, a son is given. It actually uses the past tense. A, and it's literally, in Hebrew, it's literally a youth was begotten for us. A son was given to us. And in the Septuagint version, the Greek version of the Old Testament, it says his name is called the messenger of great counsel. Now we know that Isaiah 9, 6 is talking about Christ. <clears throat> I'm going to spend actually probably a whole lesson on this um, in upcoming. It might be the act actually the next lesson. So we'll get, we're going to dig into this passage more deeply to show that this is actually the messenger of Yahweh here um, and why that's the case in Isaiah 9. <clears throat> but for now, I just want you to notice that it says his name is called the messenger of great counsel, using the exact same title as this person who, the messenger of Yahweh, who appears um, in all these previous places. And he's clearly talking about Christ because it says that the Lord God is going to give him, um, he's going to sit on David's throne and rule over, over uh, his kingdom in the next verse, in verse 7. And that's applied to Christ by Gabriel in uh, Luke chapter 1. All right. So uh, we have Christ is the messenger of great counsel. In Malachi chapter 3, this is, a, this is a really important passage. The one whom John the Baptist is going to come and prepare the way is called the messenger of the covenant in Malachi 3. And that's clearly a passage of talking about Christ because the New Testament in the Gospels quotes it and applies it to Jesus when, when he was born, so as a human. So <clears throat> Malachi 3.1 refers to Jesus, the one who John the Baptist was going to prepare the way, refers to Jesus as, quote, the messenger of the covenant. Now, this is an important statement because Remember the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Yahweh in Judges chapter 2. He says, you did not keep my covenant. And he's talking about the covenant he made with Israel at Mount Sinai. Right? The Ten Commandments and all the law of Moses. <coughs> Excuse me. And so Malachi refers to Jesus as the messenger of the covenant. And this is a reference to the Mount Sinai covenant. Of course, Jesus is also the messenger of the new covenant, which we see that he established with his disciples just before his crucifixion. Now, what's interesting about this statement here and the fact that the messenger of Yahweh claims that the covenant at Mount Sinai was his covenant is what Stephen says in Acts chapter 7 in these verses, but he identified the same messenger who spoke to Moses in the burning bush as also <clears throat> the one who gave the law on Mount Sinai. It, he, Stephen refers to him as the messenger who spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. This is not the burning bush. This is on Mount Sinai when he went up there and received the law. 
Yet according to Exodus 19.18, it says that Yahweh descended on Mount Sinai and gave the covenant. So did the Father himself come down on Mount Sinai and write with his finger in those tablets of stone? According to Stephen, it was the messenger of Yahweh who did that. And according to the messenger of Yahweh himself in Judges 2, he's the one who brought the covenant to Moses on Mount Sinai also. All right. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, this one is debatable because the passage can be interpreted a couple of different ways. But it looks like in Hebrews 3, it's actually claiming that Christ is the one who built Moses' household. I'll let you look at that passage and you can make up your mind what you think about that. But I, that's how I would interpret that passage. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, in Colossians 2, 2, the secret that was concealed in the Old Testament was the Son of God, Christ himself. In Galatians 4, 4, this is an interesting passage here that a lot of people are not aware of. But in Galatians 4, 14, Paul equates the messenger of God with Christ Jesus himself. He says that you received me as the angel or the messenger of of God even as Christ Jesus himself and so he by restating it even as he is equating the messenger of Yahweh God's messenger with Jesus Christ as being the same person in 1st Timothy 2 5 Paul says there is one mediator between God and man Jesus Christ a man Christ Jesus there is only one mediator. If Yahweh's messenger in the Old Testament is not the same person who became human and is called Jesus in the New Testament, then there are two mediators and Paul's statement is not true. But if the same person who was the messenger of Yahweh in the Old Testament became human, then it's a true statement. There is only one direct mediator between God and man and this mediator has been mediating since the very beginnings in the Old Testament and when he came as a human in the New Testament now finally the last one we're going to look at is in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 Jesus is called God's messenger the messenger of God in that passage take a look at it and you will see that it's clear that the one God sent to John to deliver the message is called God's messenger. And as you continue reading the chapter, it's clearly Jesus who appeared to John. He appears in, you know, he's described as uh, being glowing and his eyes like a flame of fire and all that. And he's delivering the message of God to John. But he is actually called the messenger of God or the angel of God in Revelation 1.1. All right, um, that's it for today. Um, we're going to continue on this theme of Yahweh's messenger. We're going to look at some more passages in the Old Testament in uh, upcoming lessons, and which I think will prove beyond any shadow of doubt that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was active in the Old Testament and he was God's mediator between God and man in the Old Testament. All right, God bless, and we'll see you next time.